This video was brought to you by Curiosity Stream. The war in Ukraine has divided opinion. While the transatlantic community are largely united in their condemnation, this isn't true for the world more generally. To take a couple of examples, China has parroted the Russian narrative about the aggression of NATO expansion, while India has taken the opportunity to increase its Russian oil imports by nearly 50 times. Lots of media attention has also been directed at Africa, where Russia has been expanding its influence in recent years, and whether or not the West can convince various African countries, who have so far refrained from direct criticism, that the oncoming food crisis is Putin's fault. Less attention, however, has been paid to Russia's Central Asian neighbours, who enjoy deep economic and security ties with Russia, but who have nonetheless been pretty lukewarm about Russia's invasion. So in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the specific case of Kazakhstan, how Russo-Kazakh relations have deteriorated since the invasion began, and what this tells us about Russia's influence in Central Asia more generally. So let's start by looking at Russo-Kazakh relations pre-Ukraine. Before the invasion, Russia and Kazakhstan were pretty good mates, with close economic and political ties. Kazakhstan is even a member of the Russian-led Eurasian Economic Union, alongside Belarus. And Russia was Kazakhstan's second largest trading partner after China, representing 10% of Kazakhstan's total trade. Most of this trade involves fuel and petroleum products, and Kazakhstan even sold petroleum to its northern neighbour at a discounted rate in order to maintain good relations. Russia and Kazakhstan have also seen significant inter-country migration. In the years since independence, some 2.5 million Kazakhs have migrated to Russia, for both economic and cultural reasons. Politically, the two countries have enjoyed similarly warm relations, despite the occasional hiccup. They're both founding members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Collective Security Treaty Organization, two big Central Asian security agreements. And in January of this year, Russian forces even intervened in Kazakhstan as part of the CSTO to help quell fuel-related anti-government protests. So, in general, Kazakhs have a pretty positive opinion of Russia, with a survey conducted by the Central Asian Barometer between 2017 and 2019, finding that 87% of Kazakhs have a favourable view of Russia, with only 8% holding an unfavourable view. The survey also found that 88% support closer relations with their northern neighbour, compared to just 6% who don't. So, given the two countries' close relations, and the fact that Russia intervened militarily in Kazakhstan just a month before the invasion, you might have expected Kazakhstan to support Putin's war in Ukraine. However, to basically everyone's surprise, this isn't how things turned out. When the invasion began on February 26th, Kazakhstan refused a request from Russia to send troops to Ukraine. The same day, Kazakhstan's president said that the country wouldn't be recognizing the independence of either the Donetsk People's Republic or the Luhansk People's Republic, eliciting an improving statement from the UN Security Council. Finally, a few days later, Kazakhstan actually sent 82 tons of medical supplies to Ukraine, clearly demonstrating that Kazakhstan did not support Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So, why has Kazakhstan opposed Putin's war in Ukraine? Well, as we see it, there are basically two reasons. Firstly, Kazakhstan's president is less pro-Russian than his predecessor was, who ruled the country for nearly 30 years until his death in 2019. Tokiev, the new president, has made it clear that he wants to pursue a so-called multi-vector foreign policy, which focuses not just on relations with Russia, but also with other neighbouring countries and so-called Western countries, like the EU and the US. In the last few years, Tokiev has made an active effort to maintain good relations with the EU by regularly visiting Brussels, implementing various political reforms, and more recently, offering to help Europe to stabilise energy prices. The second reason that they're not backing Russia, though, 
is that while Russia and Kazakhstan enjoy generally good relations, a reoccurring point of contention has been the question of whether Kazakhstan is a legitimate state. Much like with Ukraine, Putin has often questioned whether Kazakhstan is really its own national entity, and not just some post-Soviet offshoot. In September 2014, a few months after Russia's annexation of Crimea, Putin claimed that, quote, Kazakhs never had a state of their own, in response to a question about growing Kazakh nationalism. Now, this didn't go down too well with most Kazakhs or the Kazakh government, who see Kazakhstan as a historic nation state with its roots in the Kazakh Khanate, which predated the Soviet Union by some 500 years. So Putin's comments about the country triggered a furious response from the then president, who threatened to withdraw from the Eurasian Economic Union and warned Putin that Kazakhs would never surrender their independence. So you get the idea. While they're close allies, Kazakhstan isn't so keen on Putin's invasion, both because Tokayev is less pro-Russian than his predecessor was, but also because Putin has expressed similar sentiments about Kazakhstan in the past. And, well, the Kazakhs are probably wary of something similar happening to them in the future. Anyway, Kazakhstan has continued to oppose Putin's war over recent months. At the St. Petersburg Forum in mid-June, Tokayev again reiterated that he didn't respect what he described as the quasi-state formations in Donbass, and criticized Russian politicians for inflaming tensions between Russia and Kazakhstan. Now, this didn't go down too well in Moscow, and a Russian MP even implied that Russia might invade Kazakhstan, ominously noting that many Kazakh towns have a predominantly Russian population. A day after Tokayev's comments, Russian authorities announced that two of the three marine unloading buoys at the Russian point of Novorossiya would be unable to handle Kazakh oil shipments. For context, about two-thirds of all of Kazakhstan's oil is exported via the Caspian pipeline, which runs directly from Kazakhstan's largest oil and gas field, one of the deepest in the world, all the way through to the Russian port of Novorossiya in the Black Sea. And today, as a result of the pipeline, Novorossiya mostly deals with Kazakh oil, which accounts for about 90% of all exports to the port. Now, while Russian authorities claim that the suspension was due to unexploded World War II munitions in the port, the conspicuous timing and the fact that Putin has form when it comes to weaponizing energy supplies does suggest that this was political retaliation for Tokayev's comments a day earlier. Anyway, normal service was supposed to resume on July 5th, but on July 6th, a Russian court ordered the Caspian Pipeline Consortium, the company that runs the pipeline, to suspend operations for a further 30 days due to paperwork irregularities. Again, this was widely interpreted as a political retaliation for comments made by Tokayev on July 4th, when he said that Kazakhstan would increase supplies to Europe to help stabilize prices. Anyway, the next day, Kazakhstan reacted by blocking 1,700 rail cars with Russian coal on its territory. And Tokayev announced that Kazakhstan would be diversifying its energy supply routes, presumably via a new Trans-Caspian pipeline. This new pipeline, which was first proposed in the 90s, would run from Kazakhstan to Turkmenistan on the east coast of the Caspian Sea then flowing onto Georgia and Turkey, and finally into mainland Europe. This idea has been on the cards for the past 30 years or so, but Kazakhstan has refused to go ahead with it for fear of upsetting Russia. Anyway, a day later on July 8th, Kazakhstan withdrew from a 1995 currency agreement with Russia, and a leaked letter from Belarus's Ministry of Defense seems to suggest that Kazakhstan was refusing to continue with some forms of military cooperation with Belarus. Finally, on July 11th, a Russian court reversed the original decision, meaning that Kazakh oil and gas could once again flow freely into Russia. So why did Russia back down? Well, it's probably because Moscow realized that Russo-Kazakh relations were well and truly on the ropes, and in the end, Russia can't really afford to lose yet another major trading partner. 
In a sense, this is a symptom of a wider problem for Russia and its neighbours. Various former Soviet states, like Belarus and Kazakhstan, are uneasy about Russia's invasion of Ukraine and what it says about Putin's attitude towards the post-Soviet space more generally. However, many of these countries have deep economic ties with Russia, which makes calibrating relations all the more difficult. As the war drags on, it will be interesting to see how Russia's post-Soviet neighbours recalibrate their relationships and how Russia responds. If you want more from TLDR, then be sure to check out our exclusive videos on Nebula. We've got explainers on all kinds of issues, like Ukraine's alliances and Europe's lack of leadership, as well as discussions about Europe forcing Apple to use USB-C and the UK's leadership race. We've also got a bunch of fun videos, like our blooper reel and office tour. It's not only the exclusive videos either. You'll get all of our regular videos ad-free on Nebula, and often earlier than on YouTube. If you're interested, then I have good news, because we partnered with CuriosityStream, the home of the best documentaries online. And thanks to them, you can get both streaming services, CuriosityStream for the documentaries and Nebula for bonus TLDR, for less than $15 a year. That's a wild deal, and a 26% discount on their already low price. So get yourself a ton of documentaries and exclusive content from all of your favorite creators, including the Daily Briefing Extended Edition, by signing up using the link below. Thanks for your support.